Hi there and welcome to the video. I am your host John Iverson. This week I am joined to review the year in Canadian politics by two men with an impressive vintage, let's say, uh, who will hopefully pass on the benefit of their considerable experience uh, to make it all make sense. And they are Eugene Lang and Ian Brody. Uh, Ian is a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Calgary and was Stephen Harper's first Chief of Staff in 2006. Uh, Jean is an a uh, assistant professor at Queen's University School of Policy Studies and he was a Chief of Staff to two Defence Ministers in the Cretchen Martin Liberal Government. So welcome both. Um, it seems to me, despite this being the season of good cheer, uh, we're in as sour a period of our history as I can remember, and not just in politics. I mean, right across the board, uh, you know, hate crimes are up, murder rates are up, uh, trust is down, and there's a, a real nastiness to our public discourse, which, uh, I mean, I, it's not like there was ever a golden age of public discourse. I remember um, when, Ian, when your guys were in opposition in 2005, it was pretty nasty. But I, I do think that, that, that um, if Canada is not broken, it seems to be frazzled and devoid of energy. Um, at the same time, the Conservatives have spent most of this year uh, growing their lead in the polls. And I wonder whether this is the inevitable result of you know the eight-year itch, people getting tired of seeing the Trudeau government around, or whether Poiliev is actually uh, making good on things and, and actually being a, a, a positive draw rather than uh, just acting negatively. Um, let's start with you, Ian, and, and we can let it run from there. Well, I, I think the, uh, the eight-year period, this government, it seems to me, has kind of... Um, run old a little more quickly than we're used to. And maybe that's the normal course of politics in the early part of the 21st century. But uh, I think that the government had a strong first four years when they had a majority and didn't need to worry about um, where they were vis-a-vis -vis the opposition. Maybe that <clears throat> insensitivity, what was going on in the country uh, is what has run them into the two minority governments they've had since then. I'm not sure that they I'm not sure that the government's problems at the moment aren't the result of its own lack of creativity and lack of enthusiasm for governing. It seems to me that either for reasons of his family situation or something else, uh, Mr. Trudeau kind of lost his enthusiasm for governing uh, after COVID there for a while. There was kind of two years where he seemed to be not entirely connected to the public debate. And that's the period where the government lost track of the cost of living crisis, partly of its own creation, partly of international creation, um, and kind of lost track of how much it's kind of, for lack of a better word, woke progressive mode of governing and mode of speaking had kind of run its course and was now annoying more people than it was than it was enthusing. Well, my sense is that uh, since the announcement about the prime minister's uh, uh, separation from his wife a few months ago, he is plainly now grasping to get back into the public fray. I think there's every indication that he wants to run again. Um, whether the rest of the party is enthusiastic about that or not, I'm not sure matters that much. It looks like he wants to run again, and he's trying to try out some issues, some approaches on cost of living, some approaches on the international security side, um, uh, that put that put him back into a debate against an opposition leader who really very ambitiously wants to be prime minister, um, has been uh, planning to be prime minister for years, and is single-minded about wanting to capture the, the public agenda and to capture political power in a way that we haven't seen, I think, really since Mr. Mr. Harper... Um, kind of turned his mind to this in 2004 and 2005. And so uh, we're in for, I think, a, 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 an 18-month period here in the run-up to the next election, probably, uh, in which, uh, yeah, the Liberals have a lot of, a lot of uh, 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 race they have to run to catch back up to the front runner. But I do get the sense that in the run-up to Christmas, the Prime Minister was back in the game after maybe an 18-month period where he didn't look like he was all that interested in governing. 
Yeah. And so I think we're set up for a, at least the first half of 2024 where the Liberals will be trying out new things, trying to get back into the game. The problem is that for the government, the clock runs down more quickly. I mean, it's 18 months, but those 18 months run more quickly for a governing party than they do for an opposition party. And Mr. Polyev has more uh, um, options for trying out experiments uh, over the course of that time, I think, than the prime minister does. OK, Gene, we'll drill down on some of the specific uh, policy areas a little bit later, but what's your, your take on the big picture? Well, I take your point. There's a lot of pessimism and discontent and angst in the country. Although when you look at Canada in comparative perspective, we're actually doing pretty well. I mean, just yesterday, I think it was, The Economist put out a scoring of, I think it was about 20 OECD countries on basic economic measures, and we were sixth. We do have an unemployment rate that's at a historic low level. The inflation rate is higher than we'd like it to be, but it's come down by half in the last year or so. Our productivity growth numbers are terrible, but the public doesn't seem to care much about that. Um, interest rates are up. That's a problem. Uh, but overall, compared to a lot of other countries, I mean, just look at what's going on in the United Kingdom, for example. Or you pick your country. I mean, we've got problems, but they're really no more acute than the other countries would like to compare ourselves to. Just look at the United States. As for the Trudeau government, I agree with Ian. I think they've run out of gas a long time ago. Um, and I don't quite know why, but eight years is a long time. It was the two minority governments, a majority government. It may be, as Ian implies, that in this age of social media, the lifespan of governments is shorter than it used to be. They wear out earlier. That may be the case. I definitely think it looks to me like they are out of ideas, they're out of gas, and yet I think I agree with Ian as well. The Prime Minister doesn't appear to be going anywhere and seems to be poised to run again. I mean, just, just to your point on the, on the economic indicators, um, Christian Freeland keeps saying, well, we're, we're on the verge of getting back to a, a, a time of more stable economics. Um, you know, interest rates are going to come down, and, and if you look at the bond market, that seems to be the case. But people don't appear to be listening. No, they don't listen to what comes out of the finance minister's mouth. They look at what comes in the mailbox or on their bank statements. And interest rates have not come down, and they might come down. She doesn't know any more than you or I do whether they'll come down. So they're not listening to her. They're they're experiencing this, and it's and and one of the things that that on that that uh, it seems to me makes things almost impossible for a sitting government is that we had a, almost a million families renewing their mortgages at a higher rate uh, in 2023 and over the next two years we're going to have 2.2 million family, families. I mean that is not conducive to incumbent government, right? Well, I mean I wrote 18 months ago, I wrote some piece where I argued that when inflation came back as it seemed to come back it changes everything. We haven't had inflation in a generation and most people in this government have never experienced inflation, at least they don't remember it because they're too young. I'm not that young. I remember it. I remember it well. And it comes with high interest rates. And sometimes it comes with high interest rates and fairly high inflation for a long period of time. And sometimes it also comes with high unemployment. All three things. We used to call that stagflation. Uh, we don't have that. But people's interest rates on all their credit instruments, including their mortgages, have gone up a lot. That's effectively a tax. I mean, that's a, that's a big impact on people. Inflation has come down in the CPI numbers, but, but there's other uh, elements of the basket that are not coming down that much, particularly shelter costs, housing, rental housing, and even uh, you know um, housing on the on the on the market for sale. Uh, and it has not come down that much, so people are feeling it, and and I think inflation has this uh, ability to change the game for governments. And I think it has changed the game. Affordability, which is sort of a euphemism for inflation, is the number one issue in most of these polls now. Uh, and the government really doesn't have any answers for it. I'm not sure any government has any answers for it. I'm not convinced Pierre Polyev has any better answers, just different ones. I'm not right. sure to be any better. But that's the source, I think, of the basic discontent we see in the population. It's magnified by some other factors. And it's a difficult time for any government, especially one that's been in office for eight years and has basically run out of gas. And I think that's where they're at. And their leader, which used to be their signature kind of advantage, I guess, for the first four or five years, now seems to be 
a disadvantage, a drag. And that's a big change for them. Uh, in the past, it seemed that Mr. Trudeau was sort of the best asset they had politically. And now it seems like he might be a serious liability for them as they move toward closer to an election whenever that's going to happen. Ian, do you think there are inherent dangers for Pierre Poiliev and the fact that he's established a, you know, a double-digit lead? Um, you know, that there, are, there was an abacus poll this week that suggested that uh, um, you know, nearly 40% of respondents think a Poiliev government would make it harder for women to have an abortion. Uh, nearly 60% think it will impact immigration levels. Our old friend Tom Flanagan once said that uh, conservatives can't win if they veer too far to the right of the median voter. Do you think he's in a sweet spot at the moment and he can withstand any scrutiny? Well, look, uh, all of your political problems are a lot easier to manage if you're up uh, 10 or 12 points over the opposition. So that's what I mean when I say uh, the next 18 months to the election is going to run more quickly for the government than it does for uh, the Conservative Party. That said... Uh, there's no question that it's possible to peak too early in the polls. It does bring uh, attention from uh, media commentators, from the other political parties, from everybody who uh, wants to have some leverage in the next election campaign. Um, Mr. Polyev has uh, risen, the Conservative Party has risen high in the polls on this uh, idea that the affordability crisis is kind of out of control. And as Gene said, the government doesn't really have a very compelling story about what it can do about that, because in fact, I'm not sure there's much over the course of the next two years, except to hope that the world returns to normal, that they, they can do about that. I mean, stand back and the world will take care of itself is not a compelling political story for a government that's trying to get reelected. Um, other than affordability, I think what you see in the polls is um, Polyev has been very focused on the economic issues, very focused on the affordability issues. And the liberal attack, such as it is, it's been pretty, I think, weak so far, is to go back to the tropes that, you know, conservatives have a hidden agenda on social issues or so on and so forth. Um, I think what we particularly want to watch for in the next year is, said Mr. Trudeau is out trying to experiment about what his new policy agenda is, and it's kind of unnatural for him to talk about economic issues and growth issues and cost of living issues. He's much happier on the kind of social justice um, uh, issues. Um, but at some point, I assume we're also going to see the Liberals trying to trot out uh, experimental attacks on Mr. Polyev. The abortion one so far uh, fills a void uh, that's there, and the Conservatives are going to have to do something to try to respond to that. I assume also they're going to have to try to broaden out the agenda from affordability to other issues. That said, uh, on public safety, for example, we talked a little bit about public safety, particularly in urban areas, but increasingly in rural areas. Uh, this is an issue that's not really at the top of the political agenda at the moment, even though statistics show uh, uh, crime rates are, are, are an issue in some urban areas and are starting to creep up in the public agenda. Mr. Polyev's got lots of opportunity to speak about that. Uh, the party's already been out on the Liberals' bail reform, which I think kind of blew up in their face. He hasn't taken that on himself personally as much as some other people in the party have, but he has some options to expand that into a part of an agenda, even if he doesn't want to go back and answer uh, the liberal hidden agenda attack on abortion and other issues. And so that's what I mean when I say I think uh, the advantage of time is on Polyev's side relative to the government, and he has some options for the issues that he wants to fight in a way that Mr. Trudeau is in effect is on the defensive here of his government's uh, uh, agenda. Polyev has lots of options of other issues he can add to his arsenal other than affordability, and he has some time to try them out. I expect we'll see them over the course of the next next couple of months. So I think the next six months will be both Mr. Trudeau experimenting with issues in his policy agenda and attacks on Mr. Polyev to try and take him down a few points in the polls, and Polyev and his team trying to experiment if they can broaden out their agenda a bit from the affordability issues. I mean, it, it's kind of odd, though, that, you know, that while the world is on fire, Ukraine, Israel, wherever you look, uh, those issues are barely touched on by the, the Conservative leader. I mean, I understand the, the message discipline, but, uh, but if you want to be Prime Minister, you have to have a, a, offer an opinion on some of these subjects. 
Well, I think on the situation in the Middle East, probably it's been um, uh, a little bit more forward leaning uh, in the past, let's say, uh, two weeks. And certainly it's year in interviews so far, it looked like he's leaning a bit more into the Middle East issue. Um, uh, this is a difficulty because uh, it's hard to it's hard to mobilize. You know, the, the the conventional wisdom is that Canadian elections don't turn on foreign policy issues. I think that's largely true. Uh, Canada doesn't have a big foreign policy exposure in the way that the Americans do. That said, I think the growing anxiety about the safety of the world outside of Canada's borders and the extent to which that might be touching us. You see, uh, you know, terrorism arrests of radicalized uh, young men, mostly uh, recently in Ottawa and uh, uh, before that here in Alberta. As those stories start start to grab some salience, you can see, I don't think a foreign policy agenda quite, uh, but a sense of general anxiety about the world, as you say, the world on fire that's uh, catching at the edges of our house here in Canada. I think over the course of 2024, if that continues, you'll see both sets of parties trying to experiment with how do we talk about this in a way that relates to Canadians where they are, uh, as opposed to talking about it in the classic terms of Middle East foreign policy or foreign policy related to Ukraine. Gene, I mean, is it simply all over for Trudeau or can he, can he get this back? I mean, it seems to me that... Um, He's won elections by taking the kind of hopeful, positive narrative. Uh, there does seem to be plenty of ammunition that he could fire at Poiliev. Uh, let's say crypto, his, uh, Poiliev's position on crypto or his support for the Freedom Convoy or whatever. But Trudeau wins elections by being Trudeau, being the guy that you're sitting down having a beer with, being a, a different kind of populist who adopts the, the, the hopeful narrative. Is it possible to get that get that back you think uh i don't know but i don't i don't rule out that he could win another election one thing i've learned in my time is never underestimate the ability of the liberal party to win elections no anybody that underestimates Ian could tell you that anybody that underestimates the ability of the liberal party to win elections is is being foolhardy you know, it's I, I remember people, Harper lost 10 points overnight in 2004. Well, not only Before, that, one of the right? things that's changed is if you went back to the 1990s and you said to people, the Liberal Party could win a minority government with, what, 31% of the uh, popular vote and uh, uh, two or three points below the popular vote of the Conservatives, most people wouldn't buy that. Things have changed. Uh, they, they, they've got an efficient vote, as they say, uh, and they can win. I mean, I don't think they will win. But I would not be betting my house on them losing. You know, I hear all these people running around Ottawa. Polly is going to win a majority government. It's 1984 all over again. I don't buy that at all. It's way too early to tell. And as they say, campaigns do matter. And Mr. Trudeau has shown himself over the years, over the years, to be pretty competent in campaigns. But the big difference is he's just not well liked anymore. I mean, that advantage that he had. Not, not in that he's not well liked. People are fed up with him. He's overexposed. I actually see a lot of parallels, and I'd be interested in your views on this, between now and sort of February, March 1993, when Mr. Mulroney was deeply unpopular. There were polls that showed, and he had been their greatest asset, as you know, throughout the 1980s. And he had been front and center on everything throughout the 1980s, much like Mr. Trudeau has been been their greatest asset, and now he was a liability in the early 1990s as they were heading into an election that year, and he decided to leave and give a successor time to be chosen, and of course it didn't turn out very well. But I, I see actually similarities there. That the, the, the leader has been overexposed, the prime minister has been overexposed, too many things have attached to him, people are tired of him. Let's face it, the government has been divisive. They've run a divisive government. Mr. Harper's government was also a divisive government. I don't think either one of them made great efforts to unify. They were they divided and conquered. And and that wears on people, Canadians, after a while. That runs contrary to the basic Canadian psychology, I think. And eventually it wears on people. I know many, many people that supported Trudeau in more than one election, and there's no way they're voting for him anymore. They've just had it. 
And, and if he doesn't leave, and uh, as Mulroney did in 93, and give an orderly period for a successor, and it doesn't look like that's in the cards, um, you know, uh, is a, I think there's a good chance that it's not going to be a good outcome. But as I say, I would never underestimate their ability to mount a camp. They don't need to win very many. You know, they need 30%, maybe even 29% to form a minority government. Polly, have come in there that, Ian? Polyev's got to win a lot more than that to win a minority government because his vote is not nearly as efficient even now. Look, I, I mean, I agree with uh, uh, everything Gene just said, including the long track record of liberals pulling it out of the can and, and winning elections. And I've had some black eyes over the course of my career in politics from surprise come from behind um, uh, uh, wins. I think the key thing here is Gene's right. The liberals have shown, Mr. Trudeau has shown, he can scratch out 31, 32 percent uh, on election day in a low turnout election and win enough to be in a strong position for a minority government with the support of the NDP. If he loses the support of the NDP, depending on the configuration of seats after the next election, he can get the block to abstain on uh, uh, confidence motions and be able to survive. So he has that built in advantage. I also go back to, you know, before Mr. Trudeau was uh, a liberal leader, he had that kind of uh, uh, publicity stunt boxing match with uh, Patrick Brazo, the senator. Actually, I think if you go back and rewatch that tape, it shows you an awful lot of what you need to know, maybe everything you need to know about Mr. Trudeau's personality. Uh, Brazo was the big talker uh, going into that uh, uh, match. Brazo came out uh, swinging very hard in the first few minutes of that match. Brazo exhausted himself because he wasn't in fundamentally all that good shape physically. <laughs> uh, Trudeau waited, 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 Rubidu. and then pulver pulverized Brazo uh, once Brazo had exhausted himself. It turns out Trudeau had spent the time leading up to that match not talking trash about Brazo, but about training himself for the actual match and being able to outlast Brazo at the end here. So. You know, at some point, I think if the prime minister decides that he sees a reason he wants to run again and he sees some need for himself to be prime minister in the future, whether we agree with it or not, I'm not talking about this in a partisan sense, um, he's capable of being an extremely competitive uh, political figure as much as he was a boxer. It's true that uh, Paul is up 10 whatever points in the polls at the moment. But look. 18 months out from the last uh, last spring's um, uh, Alberta election here, all the same polling companies that had uh, uh, Polyev up by 15 points this fall had Rachel Notley up by 15 points against the UCP. And the last time I look out the window here, there's a UCP government got reelected in May. Uh, the ultimate optionality here is if the Liberals are still in rough shape a year from now, maybe Mr. Trudeau does reevaluate uh, his career options and decides to hand off to somebody else if it looks like there's somebody there who could take over. But for the time being, um, I think he's got a year to kind of figure out why he wants to be prime minister again for another three or four years and to give us the case. Yeah. yeah. On the boxing match, by the way, our late friend Doug Finley told me he knew Brazo was going to lose when he had a smoke with him before the bout <laughs> outside. Um, so just throwing forward, let's look, look uh, to what we expect in the coming year. We've got a budget coming up. Um, there are a lot of demands on the public purse, not least of which I think is, is defence, and maybe Gene, you want to touch on that. But, uh, but also the pharmacare, the NDP deal with the Liberals is dependent on pharmacare, and yet there are a lot of demands and not a lot of dollars. So could this be an early breach of the Liberal NDP agreement, and, and maybe we would see an election in 2024. Ian, if you want to start with that, and then we'll go to Gene. Well, look, just as, uh, as you said, a million uh, homeowners refinanced their mortgage uh, this past year in Canada and were shocked by their, their new uh, blended payment, had to extend uh, um, um, amortization periods in order to be able to afford the payments, and there's more coming this year. The government, the federal government, has a big refinancing uh, bill coming due in the next couple of months. And so the, the move from effectively 0% on government bonds to whatever it's going to be, 5 6% on government bonds, is going to have a, a direct effect on the bottom line. The biggest growth item this year in government spending is almost certain to be interest payments on the national debt. And God knows we have acquired ungodly amounts of national debt uh, over the course of the past four years for 
for various reasons. So I think the finance minister is actually in a much tougher situation than she indicated a couple of weeks ago in the fall economic statement. I really do think the pressure on the spend side is becoming, uh, I mean, you talk to officials in Ottawa about this, they're well aware of what an extremely difficult year 2024 is going to be. So everybody who's got some need that somehow we spent, you know, a trillion dollars during COVID and didn't fix defense, didn't fix Medicare or Pharmacare, didn't fix carbon capture and storage projects here in Alberta or whatever. Sorry, buddy, it's all over now. We spent a trillion dollars. If, you, if that didn't fix your problem, you're, 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 kind of, um, you're kind of late here. Does that jeopardize the government's agreement with the NDP? I don't think so. I don't think the ND, government's ND, uh, deal with the NDP was ever about getting the NDP on side. The NDP will pull the plug on this arrangement when they see an advantage in the polls and when they have enough money in the bank to call an election. That was the case for uh, Jack Layton and uh, Paul Martin in 2004, 2005, 2006. I was in the room when we had those negotiations uh, with uh, 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 with uh, Jack Layton and uh, his team. I expect the NDP will be in the same situation this time. All of these policy uh, proposals that were put into this kind of uh, supply and confidence agreement with the Liberals was to help Mr. Trudeau deal with his own internal problems inside his caucus. It closed down all of the internal Liberal caucus demands for spending on this side. The other thing you could say, look, sorry, I like what you're saying, but we have this deal with the NDP. I can't afford to burn them. Uh, I think that the, um, if the government does find they need to offer up something in the window for Pharmacare to keep the NDP on side, they'll slice that cheese as thin as they can. And if the mice on the NDP are still hungry for the cheese, they'll go with it. And if they decide they want to pursue an election campaign, we'll have an election. But for the time being, I can't see that the polls are decisively strong enough for the NDP to want an election. It's not clear to me that their financial situation is strong enough to have a national election campaign. And as a result, I think that the Liberals have some room to maneuver here. They're going to need it, considering how very, very difficult the fiscal situation is for the spring budget. Gene? Yeah, well, you said you asked uh, whether they might find themselves in breach of the supply agreement. They're already in breach of it. The supply agreement called for a Canada Pharmacare Act to be passed by the end of 2023. The House has risen, so that act isn't going to happen. Um, I agree with Ian. I don't. There's this sort of charming, naive view of the NDP as being these really principled social democrats, and what they really want is policy, not power. And uh, and they've, they're getting policy, and they don't really want power. Uh, I don't subscribe to that view. The NDP is just like every other political party. They want power, or the trappings of power, or they want to get close to power. Which, which is, by that I mean. If, if, it, if it came down to them trading influence over the Liberals for the keys to Stornoway, they would choose the latter. They don't have the support in the polls that I've seen right now to have a reasonable expectation of that, but they're heading in the right direction. And we don't know where the bottom is for the Liberals and where the bottom is for Trudeau. And if he's as deeply unpopular as some of the polling on him suggests, we might find in the new year they start to get polling numbers that suggest they could actually form the official opposition. As crazy as that sounds, although it's not unprecedented. And if they get into that territory, I agree with Ian, it doesn't matter what's in the supply agreement, they will vote against the government in the confidence vote. And there'll be lots of confidence votes, lots of opportunity to do that, starting in the budget and following the budget through the estimates votes in the spring. So I think you got to watch that space very carefully. It doesn't look like the Liberals are going to do that much on Pharmacare. I agree with Ian. The fiscal situation is difficult. I won't say this government has run a reckless fiscal policy, but it's not run a prudent one either. And uh, David Dodge pointed out uh, in something that he wrote with Bennett Jones, I think, a few days ago, they're now spending 10, 10% on, on uh, debt servicing costs. That's sort of a threshold that some economists think they should stay below. Um, they haven't hit, this government hasn't hit any of their fiscal targets or fiscal anchors in their time in office. They have no credibility on any of that. Freeland has no credibility on any of that as far as I'm concerned. I don't expect them to hit any of their fiscal targets. I expect them to be under lots more pressure to spend and they will spend and they will tell us that it's okay to spend because they've got a fiscal anchor in place that's going to be honored someday, somehow, somewhere.
It will be, in the words of the British, uh, British columnist Simon Hogarth, like watching Edward Scissorhands make toy balloon animals. So <laughs> I like can, that. Uh, we can look forward to that. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Stimulating discussion. It was great to have you on. Thank you for Good having me. Good to see you, John. Good to see both of you. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas to you. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Oh.